Good morning and welcome to Unilever's second quarter and half year results presentation. Today we're doing this via webcast. For the full year results, we'll be back with a physical meeting in London, but for the mid-year we thought you'd appreciate a bit more time in your own offices in a busy results season. We hope to see many of you in person at our annual investor event, which this year we will be hosting at our Colworth Research Facility here in the UK at the start of December. And you will receive more news about that very soon. In the usual way, the presentation of our results this morning will be given by Paul and John Mark. Paul is going to share his perspectives on the first half year. John Mark will cover the financial highlights. And Paul will finish by looking at what we need to do to stay ahead of the curve in this increasingly challenging world. We start with the usual disclaimer relating to forward-looking statements and non-GAAP measures. And with that, let me hand over to Paul. Thank you, James, and good morning to everyone. Let me start with some reflections on where we've got to in our strategy to transform Unilever. After years of underperformance, we set out to become a sustainable growth company. And this meant investing more, investing behind our brands, our people, as well as capabilities. We also strengthened the innovation funnel with bigger and better launches that we now roll out faster. These solid set of results we've just announced show once more that the transformation is fully on track and that the company is competitive on most fronts. As is so often the case, this is a journey that needs to be completed in stages. And I appreciate the fact that you've been patient with us in this first part. This stage has got Unilever back to being a growth company, a prerequisite for long-term value creation, with particularly strong performance in the emerging markets and in the personal and home care categories in line with our strategy. We are therefore delivering to our strategic choices. As we all discussed together in Paris, we have now moved into the second phase of the journey. In this stage, we need to better balance the top line growth with the gross margin improvement so that we're able to fuel further investments as well as driving profitability. We also need to deliver superior growth in food and refreshment, which is obviously an important part of our portfolio. After 12 months, we've started to focus on what we call, about, sorry, about 12 months ago, we started focusing on what I call maxing the mix. And this is now bearing fruits. More and more of our innovations are landing in the market with more added benefits to our consumers, and that helps us justify the premium pricing and the better gross margins. And encouragingly, that's also reflected in our funnel of future innovations. With close to three quarters of these uh, future innovations set to deliver above average gross margins. Now, mixing the mix also means making choices focusing on more profitable growth opportunities, sometimes foregoing less valuable volume, lending pricing where needed, and making sure that our promotions are efficient. We've also been reviewing our SKU ranges, eliminating the lowest profitable ones where needed. And obviously, we've stepped away from some of our businesses which promise volumes but at unattractive returns. In parts, for example, of our U.S. ice cream business, we've been able to do that. At the same time, we've stepped up cost efficiency programs on top of an already very active plan, including the rollout of the low-cost business models we talked to you about in laundry and ice cream. We've been paying particular attention to these two businesses where we also felt that the profitability was too low. And again, results are starting to show. We will talk more about that later as we need to set the bar even higher once more in light of the changing competitive environment. All of this has enabled us to deliver consistent, competitive, responsible, and profitable growth. Above all, it has helped us to improve growth margins despite the increased competitive intensity and, yes, challenging macroeconomic conditions. We've been consistently transparent with you on the way we see the global economy developing. Economies in Europe are expected to stay soft and markets are expected to stay down. The real issue of relative competitiveness, frankly, is not being addressed fast enough and we all know that the political system is gridlocked. In the US, indicators are still mixed as well, although some more positive signs. I think it's way too early, though, to call victory. 
While some of the confidence and employment data would point to a modest economic improvement, this unfortunately has not flown through to our markets where consumer spending is still flat. The enormous deficits also still need to be addressed, and don't forget them. Add to this that on both sides of the Atlantic, competition and promotional intensities are once again increasing, with often value-destroying activities. Now, in emerging markets, again, as we've been continuously pointing out to you, there also continues to be noticeable slowdown. Brazil, Russia, India, and China have all seen downgrades to growth forecasts, and the markets in which we operate certainly have slowed. Many of the currencies have weakened at an accelerated pace, and some of you have seen significantly. Citizens are demanding transparency, accountability, and good governance at increasing rates. Protests on the streets of Egypt are not isolated incidences anymore, as recent events in Turkey and Brazil have shown. Now, we're re realistic about this new normal. We believe we are well-placed to navigate this FUCA world. The Unilever Sustainable Living Plan is a potential source of competitive advantage and increasingly recognized as such in this environment we now live. And we're starting to see this greater awareness and recognition, not only from the outside, but also translated in these sustainable results that we are giving you. Against this background, I am pleased with the first half results. Underlying sales growth grew at 5%, in line with the first quarter. It was a good balance between volume and price. In fact, volume was 2.6% in the first half, which was ahead of our markets. And if you look at, for the ones who want to go into the details, the second quarter, volume actually picked up to 3% as pricing eased. The emerging market business potential is also clear. It posted again another quarter of double-digit growth. This reflected the investments made behind our innovations, market development, and obviously the in-market discipline you have now become accustomed to with the rollout of the Perfect Store program, which we actually expect to reach about 6 million outlets globally by the end of this year. Now, I'm especially pleased to see home care delivering continued strong uh, top-line growth, but now also combined with a step-up in profitability, despite a very high and actually increased competitive intensity. We have invested significantly in improving our product formulations in this category, and that shows through in the head-to-head -head blind testing on performance. Despite these investments, gross margins are up enormously as we work mix and expand our low-cost business models we talked about. The new detergent with wash booster for outstanding results even in quick wash helped to drive double-digit growth for the Dirt is Good brand. And our superior liquid relaunch that is now starting to hit the world with the best product ever undoubtedly will help us maintain this momentum. The consistency and the consistent above-market growth in personal care also shows what can be achieved in combination with strong innovations and well-supported brands. The recent launches, like X Apollo, already in 60 countries, and the continued success of Tresemme, Dove Men Plus Care, as well as Clear, show the benefits of rolling out strong global innovations across multiple regions. In both home care and personal care, share gains are broad-based across the world. Now, the food business is also showing signs of picking up as stronger innovation plans are put in place and we focus on fewer, bigger brands. This is starting to pay off. Let's look at that in detail. Savory and dressings both now show solid growth. Knorr, our largest brand and priority here, grew nearly 5% in the quarter. This was driven by market development activities, such as the What's for Dinner Tonight campaign, consumption building activities, especially in Africa, and further extension of the superior performing baking bags and jelly bouillons. Now, we've also seen signs of improvements in spreads and are optimistic that we're back on the right track. Second quarter sales development was better than the first, although still negative. We expect to see a continuation of this improving trend in the remainder of the year as we continue to work on the price, taste, and naturalness of our products. In fact, the gold variants that have already been introduced in more markets are doing well. In refreshments, there has been a further improvement in our tea business, and you know what I thought about this, but now it's demonstrating continued progress. In fact, this is the first full year 
of our turnaround plan. This includes the successful launch of the new, even better tasting Lipton Yellow Label teas in a number of countries. And we've been successfully building a more global ice cream business, as you know, with 40% of our sales now in emerging markets, where the sun tends to shine for more of the year. That meant that we could roll out a very, that we could compensate for a very poor start to the season here in Europe and the US, as well as rationalize portfolios by eliminating low profitability, but still grow overall on this business. I have already referred to the work we have done across the business on maxing the mix and stepping up cost efficiency programs. As a result of these activities, gross margins increased by 120 basis points, with actually all categories improving. And core operating margin, as a result, was up 40 basis points. This again after a substantial reinvestment back into our brands, enabled by the headroom from these higher gross margins. Specifically, we've actually increased once more our spend on advertising and promotion by over 200 million or 40 basis points in the first half, building our brand equities across all media channels. Our digital investments are up 20% in the first half, on top of the 50% increase from last year. Digital has already become an indispensable part of most of our brand communications. And the results we're getting are unprecedented. Take, for example, the recent Duff Real Beauty sketches, which showed how, as a global company, we can harness the power of digital wealth in an agile and nimble way to create a global phenomenon. In less than a month's time, it had over 200 million views. This gained it the recognition of being the most watched advertising online ever. By the way, this digital strength is also shown in China, where our Cornetto micro movie and music videos have just hit 370 million viewers. And I had to ask twice if this number was right, but I can confirm it. The quality of our advertising has been recognized with 44 Cannes Lion Awards this year, making Unilever the most awarded advertiser, well ahead of any of our main competitors. But what means even more to us is that in the same week, Unilever was rated as the most effective advertiser of the EVRIS Worldwide Index. So we're on the right track to strengthen and continue to strengthen our brand equities. Now you've heard us talk many times about the virtuous circle of growth and the first half year results shows that this is now starting to gain traction. And you can see from this chart that we've put the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan at the center of that model. It is now firmly established in the business and shaping our brands and supply chain strategies. Innovations like the new compressed deodorant in the UK show how consumers increasingly understand and appreciate the benefits of less waste and products they buy as long as they do not have to compromise on performance and value. At the same time, we're reducing waste and saving costs in our supply chain. More than half of our manufacturing sites have already achieved zero non-hazardous waste to landfill. And we have now set ourselves the target of having all of them achieve that by 2015. That's again a new standard being set in our industry. We also continue to manage the future risks in our supply chain. With 36% of our agriculturally raw materials already coming from renewable sources, we also have a better grip on the volatility that increasingly is there. And I was pleased to see that our recent hosting of the Global Food Security and Nutrition event in London as part of the GA meetings, with many heads of state present, is starting to translate itself into further growth opportunities for Africa. Now let me now pass over to Sean Mark, who will cover the financial performance in more detail. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning to everybody. Following the approach we took at the last full year results presentation, I will focus only on the key financials for the half year, and that should give us more time to answer your questions. As before, we've included an appendix in this presentation which shows the development of turnover for the second quarter. So let's start. As you have seen, underlying sales grew by 5% in the first half year, driven by the emerging market growth, double digit at 10.3%. 
Let me just say a few words, though, about developed markets, where sales were down by 1.6% in the first half year and by 1.3% in the second quarter. There was an improvement in Europe from the first quarter to the second, and we posted volume growth, which was ahead of our markets. Ice cream sales, as you would know, were slightly up in the second quarter, and that's despite the poor weather, and spreads continued to decline, although less than in Q1. In the remainder of the business, sales were flat in markets that were down. Turning to North America, performance was mixed. We have maintained share in total, and our personal care business specifically continues to do well. Our share in hair care remains well ahead, but sales in the second quarter were down as we lapped pipeline fill ahead of a major launch last year and with evidence of some trade destocking this year. Now, Paul has already referred to the actions we took to step away from volume in ice cream with low profitability SKUs, and that is something that we did in the second quarter. And in spreads, we maintained share, but margarines have been losing out to butter for the same reasons as in Europe. Paul will return to this later. Weaker exchange rates, particularly in Brazil, India, South Africa, Argentina, and Indonesia, had an adverse effect on turnover of around 3.2%. And during the second quarter, a number of these currencies, as well as others, slipped even further. Today, if the rates were to stay where they are for the rest of the year, we would expect the drag on turnover to be closer to 4.5% for the full year. The impact of M&A in the half was a negative 1.1%, and this is principally from the disposals of Skippy and frozen foods in the U.S., and as a result, our turnover increased by 0.4% only. Gross margin, an area that we focused a lot on, was up 120 basis points in the first half of the year. The margin improvement is being driven both by cost efficiency programs and the benefit from maxing the mix, which Paul spoke about earlier and we discussed a lot with you at the Deutsche Conference. Commodity costs were higher, largely as a result of the weaker currencies which affect the prices we pay in local markets. We continue to expect low to mid-single-digit inflation for the year as a whole. Advertising and promotions increased by 40 basis points. Overheads were 40 basis points higher against a low prior year comparator, which included the profits on a land sale in India, which we talked about this period last year. And so, core operating margin was up 40 basis points. It is no coincidence that home care and refreshments, the two categories where we have been rolling out the low cost business models approach, showed the greatest improvement in operating margin. This program goes well beyond our traditional savings activities, which have tended to focus on incremental opportunities within product and supply chain costs. Instead, the low cost business model teams looked at the whole value chain end-to-end in a holistic way, from the way we sell, promote, and advertise our products, to the way we distribute them, and all the way back through factories to the sourcing of the materials. In laundry, we have applied this technique to about half of our turnover so far in terms of identifying opportunities, and we have translated around half of the potential in those countries into realized savings in the P&L to date, so around a half. Very encouragingly, in the first wave of the rollout, where we are already into the stage of tracking delivery, we are seeing improvements in margins well above the rest of the business. So the opportunity to improve profitability in this category is clear. At the same time, we do see rising competitive intensity here, and we will reinvest savings as needed. As you also know, We have a parallel program in ice cream, which is also delivering good results, and we are in the early stages of testing the approach beyond that. Turning to free cash flow, this was at 1.3 billion, which is 200 million lower than in the first half of last year, 
but 0.5 billion up on the year before that. Now, these swings reflect differences in the mid-year working capital position. When we look at working capital, what is more important than the position at a single point of time is to look at the average over the period. And that shows that our position, already very negative in terms of working capital and working capital days, has continued to improve. Capital expenditure was at 0.6 billion, with a number of important projects being realized in the second half of the year. And that is the reason why we still expect the full year to be in line with our guidance of 4 to 4.5% of group turnover. Turning to core earnings per share, our core EPS increased by 3.6% to 76 euro cents. You will remember that we are now reporting under the revised IS-19 for pensions, with the back year restated to that standard. The earnings from underlying sales growth and operating margin improvement were partly offset by exchange rate movements and slightly higher interest rates. At constant exchange rates, EPS increased by 7%. Turning to the balance sheet, adjusted net debt at the mid-year was 9.9 billion, up 2.5 billion on the year-end position. This includes the adjustment for the final amount actually paid for HUL shares following the closure of the voluntary offer. As the offer was still open on the 30th of June, the published mid-year balance sheet shows the full potential liability. The net pensions deficit reduced by 0.9 billion to 2.4 billion. This is on a like-for-like -like IS-19 basis. The reduction here, a very important reduction, reflects cash contributions made, returns on investments, and the impact of higher interest rates used to discount liabilities. The cash expenditure on pensions for the year is still expected to be around 900 million euros and some 400 million euros of that were spent in the first half of this year. And lastly, the quarterly dividend is unchanged at 26.9 euro cents, following Q1's increase at 10.7%. Finally, let me confirm the position on the transactions in South Asia. The voluntary open offer for Hindustan Unilever shares closed on the 4th of July and completed on the 18th. We have acquired just shy of 15%, 14.8 to be exact, of the outstanding shares, which takes our shareholding up to 67.3. The investment has been a total of 2.5 billion euros. In Pakistan, we have so far acquired over 20% of the outstanding shares, taking our shareholding above 97% through an investment of around 350 million euros. With these investments, we have increased our share of earnings that comes from these attractive markets. And with that, let me pass back to Paul. Thank you, Sean Mark. And I think from all that you've heard, you can conclude that we've come a long way. Step by step, we've put our competitiveness back as we've put in place again the building blocks for sustainable and now also profitable growth. And you've seen again many proof points and the numbers we have shared with you this morning. But not only that, the resilience and consistency that we have built has enabled us to compete well in what has proved to be, again, an increasingly demanding environment. This has been the fit to compete part that you've heard us talk about so often. And the first half results show encouraging signs that we are becoming fit to win. But I believe the external environment will again get tougher. And we have to set the bar once more higher to continue to outperform the market. No doubt that competitors have been restructuring at an accelerated pace, and some have translated that again in significantly increased promotional activity. And we also see changes on the competitive front, be it through changes in the ownership of global players or the rise of new local and regional competitors in emerging markets. They're setting new benchmarks as well. And finally, the economic background will remain challenging for the foreseeable future. This means that we have to raise our game once more to the next level. We're well placed to respond to these challenges and we'll talk much more about this at our investor event in December. 
But there are three areas that are already clear to me where we have to up the game. The first one is to continue to step up our pace of innovations, and I would always say that. The second one is to need to rebase once more our costs. And the third one is the need to continue to push for this improved performance on food. Now let me say a little bit on each of those. In the first year or two of the journey to transform Unilever, better in market execution was probably the most important factor behind the improvements that we made. In my view, that has now been complemented by the innovation pace, which has become bigger, brought faster to the market, and spread out across more markets faster. And let me reassure you that our innovation pipeline has never been as robust as it is now. At the start of this year, we've made further changes to bring the R&D organization more into the specific category teams. This will ensure that going forward, we have full alignment of the research programs to the category strategies, sharper choices in the allocation of resources, and greater speed by bringing marketing and development closer together. Our partner to win efforts with our key suppliers are now also starting to pay off, with banner innovations from these suppliers starting to hit the market as well. And we were pleased to see that for the main pool of suppliers, we were voting, voted the preferred partner. And that is obviously very reassuring for future innovations. We have already gone a long way in the quest for bigger, better innovations and rolled out faster. We're reaching more countries than ever before, have reduced the elapsed time before, between launching in the first market and the last, and as a result, see a significant step up on the incremental turnover behind these innovations. Now let me just give you one or two examples in each of our categories to make that come alive. Start with personal care. You can actually see here the new Duff repair expertise range of hair care products. And if you haven't tried yet, yet, I encourage you to do that. It's probably the best product that is on the market. The shampoo includes a new smoothing system with a triple action to give a smooth coating, superior alignment of wavy hair and protection of the most damaging parts of hair at the tips. The conditioners use a proprietary micro sheet technology, offering a better feel when wet and superior hair detangling. And the range, the range includes actually three new post-wash variants with unique benefits. We have already launched in 12 countries in just two months' time. Now in home care, we have just launched this new concentrated liquid detergent in the UK, probably again the best that is available. This very innovative packaging comes with a built-in stain eraser ball, making pretreatment and dosing easier. And the formulation has been improved to give the best ever stain remover. In foods, the Knorr jelly bouillons continue to show their relevance in the wider range of kitchen environments as this great innovation travels around the world. Most recently, we've used the same technology to launch a range of jelly meal makers. In this case, we started in Russia, which will help in the preparation of local dishes. And the latest baking bag flavors in Latin America are another good example of global innovations made locally relevant. Meanwhile, we have strong campaigns supporting these new taste propositions. We've launched liquid margarines, and we've enhanced the rollout of the naturalness of spreads. These initiatives are landing, most of them in the second half of this year. In refreshments, Magnum has had another exciting set of innovations this year, from five kisses to pinks and black, and obviously the rollout of our pleasure stores. There is clearly no end to the creativity of this brand. And finally, the new Lipton Yellow Label Teas, with patented tea essence technology that captures the full aroma, has boosted growth to double-digit levels in the markets where it actually already has been launched. So some good examples of what we're doing already, but I'll be the first one to say that there is still a lot of room to make even more of our innovations, make them more relevant to more people in more markets. In other words, even bigger and better. Now let me turn to costs. In an increasingly competitive world, we need to continually review the competitiveness of our cost base. And this needs to be done with rigor and discipline. Our ongoing savings program must continue to deliver and be pushed even harder. Jean-Marc has told you about the good progress we're making with the low-cost business model approach in laundry and ice cream. That has some way to go still, 
and we are already starting to test its relevance in other categories as well. Beyond this, we are determined to continuously drive out costs which consumers increasingly are not willing or able to pay for. This means driving beyond today's levels of overheads and finding greater levels of productivity in all areas of spend. We can also, as an organization, be faster and more agile. A key enabler to both is to simplify and streamline our business processes and to reduce complexity further. This is feedback we continuously get from our people as well. We've made progress, but deeper in the organization, there is still too much getting in the way of clear accountability and fast decision making. We are determined to fix this, and we'll speak more again about this when we meet in December. We've recently announced as a first step that we are bringing together our enterprise services and IT organizations under our new hat, Mark Smith, reporting into Sean Mark. This will help us to leverage the scale now across both areas and to open up opportunities for productivity gains that were not so apparent before when they were managed separately. And what we can do more to extend our global procurement capabilities in areas beyond materials and production we're going after as well. We think we can do all of this without the need for major restructuring by maintaining the discipline you are now used to from Unilever. And we are mindful of building this way better shareholder value than spending enormous amounts of restructuring money again at your expense. But we must remain acutely focused on cost efficiency. I've said before that it is important that foods and refreshments grow faster. In refreshments, I'm pleased to see the underlying improvements now coming through. The turnaround plan in tea is showing results behind the move to the more premium variants and the renewed support. In ice cream, the focus on return of assets is already bringing improved margins and sharper capital choices. For foods, it is likely to be perhaps 12 months later than I frankly would have liked to see. Our foods portfolio is, however, stronger than it was. The footprint is more skewed towards emerging markets now, and we have disposed of many of our businesses around the peripheries, where, as a result, our sales are now concentrated on fewer, bigger brands. For example, the emerging markets are now close to 40% of our sales, up from just 20% not so long ago. And nearly two-thirds of our turnover is now in our 4 billion euro food brands as a result of this aggressive divestiture of these non-strategic assets. These are brands with strong equities and broad relevance. It's also probably now the most focused food portfolio of its kind, with leading positions globally. That, I believe, is particularly important when it comes to leveraging the R&D to bring our innovations to market across the countries and regions. Now, in spreads, we know what to do. But it's also fair to say that I am as frustrated as you are in the progress we've made here. And part of these challenges, frankly, have been self-inflicted. It is about staying price competitive. It is about getting the right taste. And it is about the perceived naturalness of our products. That is the way to unlock the growth in this category. That is also the way that the growth is merited in this category, as the healthy alternative to butter. It will take time, but we have the technology, marketing skills, scale, and now also the organization to deliver. So with that, let me wrap up. Our priorities for 2013 remain unchanged. These are volume growth ahead of our market, steady and sustainable improvement in core operating margin, and, yes, strong cash flow. We live in an uncertain world, but we remain focused on growing both top and bottom line. I hope that the results once more we've shared with you today show that we really now can walk and chew gum at the same time. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let me now open the line for questions. Okay, let me just remind you, if you want to ask a question, press star 1. Uh, if, by the time we get to you, the question has already been asked, you can press star 2, and then you'll drop off the question list. Uh, if you're uh, listening using a speakerphone, it's really helpful if you could use the handset to ask the question so that everybody can hear you. Uh, please, please keep the questions to a maximum of two. I can see there's quite a few callers already on the line, so that's uh, it's really good if you can do that. And please uh, just announce who you are 
and where you're from before you ask the question. And I think the first up on the line, if I can see, yes, is Harold Thompson of Deutsche Bank. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, yes, Harold Thompson from Deutsche Bank. Uh, I've just got two questions. Um, the first one, uh, clearly on, on gross margins, very impressive, up 120 basis points. Uh, and I think, Jean-Marc, you said that, uh, you know, the, the work on ma maxing the mix, uh, you know, has contributed to that performance. Um, you know, without wanting to get carried away, um, you know, how, how much has this maxing the mix contributed to that, to that 120 basis point? Uh, and therefore, how should we think about the potential uh, for that program uh, to help Unilever uh, going forward. Um, the second one is, is more a pricing question. 2% uh, pricing in the quarter, it, it keeps coming down. I guess the pass-through effect would mean we'd get to close to zero by year-end. Uh, what can you tell us on, on how pricing stroke, I guess, input inflation uh, will, will look like in the second half? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Harold. The, uh, I'll get into the gross margin for one second, and I'll have, ask Sean Mark to do the pricing part of this. On the uh, gross margins, I appreciate that. Uh, maxing the mix is obviously a key driver when you do 120 basis points, um, which so far seems to be ahead of uh, other reported results. Uh, I also like to remind you, uh, and, and you probably are the first one to know that, Harold, that we already started our journey of gross margin improvement over the second semester of last year. So there seems to be more consistency coming in. As you see, the delta of these improvements between ice cream and laundry where we focused on and um, the rest of our business. It is also fair to say that personal care and foods are actually increasing its gross margin as well. So, and they have not really been benefiting yet from this expansion of these low-cost business models. So if you see 170 basis points, uh, at least 100 uh, to 120 basis points is low-cost business models, but the rest is uh, obviously the discipline of getting rid of your low profitable variants, the more profitable innovations. 75% of our innovations we now launch are margin accretive, uh, and these are uh, efforts that have been done across the board. So we think it is uh, well implemented now with discipline across all the categories, uh, but we also think there's more juice to come. On pricing, I'll uh, hand it over to Jean-Marc, uh, but before that, let me just simply point out that as you, we've always said pricing will ease off a little bit, so that should not be a surprise to any of us. But I also hope that you have noticed that across the, the categories, the volume component is actually picking up, and that's the most important thing for us. So it's quality of growth that counts, and I'll hand it over to Shamar. Sure. Th thanks, Paul. So just f for the second half, um, we don't expect any further price increases in either Europe or, uh, or North America. And if anything, it could be slightly, uh, slightly negative. I think that there, um, there will be pricing expected from the emerging markets, given the currency devaluation that we've talked about. So... Um, the, the, the UPG of the second half will probably be a, a little less than the first half. Just some color on the first half, UPG was at 2.3%, rollover was around 1.5%. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we now have uh, Celine Panuti. Hello, Celine. Yes, uh, hello, good morning. Um, all right, uh, I have to choose my two questions. Uh, the first one on, um, uh, on uh, the, what you mentioned for the America zone. On one hand, you mentioned that Brazil was helped by uh, uh, the SAP uh, rollout with volume uh, in, and as well, you've seen a, a hit on U.S. sales because of uh, um, some destocking. Could you uh, maybe... Uh, give a bit of uh, color on the magnitude of those. Um, I understand that maybe Latin American uh, in Brazil, the issue could be a quarterly effect, but I was wondering in, Q, uh, in the U.S., uh, um, one of your competitors has mentioned a slowdown in the mass market in personal care, so whether that could be uh, something that will be more ongoing in the coming quarters. That must be a question. Second question, coming back on what you just said about uh, um, all uh, the positive on gross margin and maxing the mix, um, is there a way you could maybe help us to understand the balance of what you say, a top-line investment and an environment that is competitive versus all those goodies that you're making on, on the cost side. Um, 
I remember at the full year stage, I did ask you if you were happy with 30 basis point consensus. You said yes. Um, now your margin is up 40. Uh, shall we raise the bar there? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Celine. I appreciate that. The, um, let me quickly write down because there are two good questions. If you first take the Americas, um, again, I just want to be clear. Yeah, we've always had a slowdown in these economies, and you actually see that happening. You just have to look at the, the numbers, uh, macroeconomic numbers of Brazil, as you mentioned, and uh, you know what we are talking about. Despite that, we have uh, double-digit growth in Brazil, and under Fernando Fernandes, uh, do very well. Uh, we've launched Tresemme, which is now the second biggest hair care brand. We see um, our uh, Knorr brand behind the baking bags and the bouillons uh, getting stronger. We see uh, Magnum uh, growing uh, behind a uh, very focused plan on ice cream and doing well there. Thank you very much. And our laundry business, I like to remind everybody, despite having to deal with competitors at 30% lower pricing or more, still have a 70% share. And that's a share that you also found a few years back. So the competitive battles are won as well. So we know what to do. And Latin America will always have its ups and downs in some of the countries, depending on the political situations or some of the other battles. But we are getting good returns, and we continue to grow double-digit there. The America, North America, we agree with you. We've always said, again, that North American market is basically flat. I've said that before. And I also think that the growth that you're there seeing is not very well spread. We need growth that touches everybody in the population. Uh, we like employment levels to go up. We like consumer confidence to go up across the population to do well. Personal care markets are broadly flat. Interestingly, on personal care, on the case Kreidhoff's capable leadership, we have grown the shares in all categories. We are now the number one in hair care from number three. We continue to grow share. We continue to grow share in deals. We continue to grow share in skin cleansing. So the strategy that we've put in place, we're happy about at the same time as you've seen is that we have now nearly come to the end of streamlining our portfolio to make it more strategic and in line with the overall company. Because frankly, we were a little bit all over the place. And these big investments are now out of the system. The reason the volume is slightly down over the, or, or the, the, the USG is slightly down over the first half is really because in the base, uh, we had the uh, shipping launches for our hair care launches last year and, and one or two other things. We are less concerned about that. But having said that, we need to continue to set the bar high in the U.S., and we have uh, plans to continue to do that. On gross margins, I'll um, uh, bring it back to uh, Sean Mark to give another perspective on that so you can hear it from him. But indeed, behind these gross margin results, um, it is fueled by innovations, as I've now pointed out, and you see increasingly the proof points of that from the discussions we're having and the examples we show you. And actually... We're one of the few companies that continue to significantly step up its investments in AMP as well to put our word where it is. And then we see the effectiveness of these investments going up. The reason I mentioned these every awards is not to say uh, aren't we good, but it is really a recognition from the outside world uh, what a change has happened in a company like this and the effectiveness of our spending is going up. So let me just uh, pass on to uh, Sean Mark for the second part. Okay, thank you. I mean, not appropriate at this point in time just to comment on consensus, but what I would say is, is the fact that in the second half of the year, on the one hand, there are prior year comparators, which are a little bit more difficult. On the other hand, we have to step up our discipline around overheads, and this is an environment where we need to continue to invest in our business, be it in terms of product, support for our brands, and the like. We have a good view given our forwards in terms of commodity impacts, uh, which, as you know, are always between three to six months. And the, tr the work that we're trying to do on maxing the mix, again, as Paul said, is, is structural. So we're confident with the types of margin leverage that we're trying to achieve. But most importantly is to walk, chew, and gum, is to grow and drive margin at the same time. Thanks, Celine. Okay. I Thank you. Thank you, Celine. I think we've got John, John Cox now on the line. Good morning, guys. Uh, John Cox with Kepler Chevro. Um, I, I, I keep coming back to the, the, some of the questions that have been asked before. In North America, um, the underlying sales growth appears to be you know, negative 2% in Q2 if you, if you strip out um, Q1. You, you seem to be saying there's some one-offs in there. You talk about the comparable. You talk about the phase-out of ice cream. I wonder if you can sort of quantify them at all. And also, you to be saying that, you know, that, that's the worst of it over. 
we should you should start to go positive in the second half of the year. Is is, is that correct? And then just on the, the second question, um, to come back to the commodities um, a viewpoint, you know, would you agree with the statement that in the first half you didn't get any benefits at all from, you know, what, what is generally an easier commodity environment, and you should start to see those improvements come through in the second half of the year, and this will add to the 120 basis points improvement we're already seeing with the maxing the mix and the, and the low-cost business model, and as a result, the gross margin improvement for this year is going to be above that 120 basis points. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. We'll continue the tradition that I'll take the first one and shall mark the second one on the commodities, if you don't mind. If you look at uh, America itself, I just want to re reiterate again, we are actually growing share in about 56% is the exact number, I'm looking at a sheet here, of our business. So it is healthy, but the market has slowed down a little bit. And there is some effect of facing that is in there. Uh, looking forward, the U.S. will be a slow growth market in line with the economy. I don't want to deny that. But I think we are well placed. We don't see any surprises. And the actions we take, the investments we make in our industrial base or in our brands give me confidence that we will uh, show that growth and we don't get carried away by three months here. But our spreads and dressings business is growing. We're just celebrating the Hellman's 100th uh, anniversary. We see good shares there. We have just launched the Lipton Cups. We were late, no doubt about that. But that's a big growing part of the market in beverages in the U.S. We're just entering as we talk. A Vaseline that historically has been, frankly, a neglected brand in the U.S., if I may be strong and firm. We have just launched the Spray and Go variant, which is doing extremely well. And the brand is moving back. Our other PC business is growing. So we uh, are starting to work now in the normal sequence of doing everything step by step. Our Knorr business, and um, I'm convinced that that comes back as well. On ice cream, we've been uh, having a little softness, and that's a big part of our U.S. business. And frankly, we've taken there the decision with our maxing the mix that we take, uh, don't uh, uh, sell the unprofitable variants anymore. We've actually pared down our portfolio in ice cream. And then obviously we've had the weather effects there, but we don't want to complain about that since we can't do anything about it anyway. So if I look at the U.S. going forward, if I look at the plans that uh, Case Crowdhoff is putting in place, I'm confident there that uh, with the portfolio getting aligned with the company, with the innovation programs that we have, the actions we've taken, that we will be able to continue to perform well in what is indeed an increasingly competitive environment. We're growing our hair care while some of our competitors basically are giving the products away. Don't underestimate that. And you see the same in deals. So we are not in the maxing the mix philosophy uh, into buying brands, uh, buying via promotional activity or lowering prices. Uh, this is quality, uh, what you get, and that can only be to the long-term benefit of our shareholders. Let me have uh, Jean-Marc go into detail a little bit on the commodity side. Yes, uh, thank you. But please do not extrapolate the gross margin of 120 basis points. Um, firstly, remember that uh, gross margins were up 60 basis points in the second half of last year. So again, this maxing the mix program has been going on for quite a time now, 12 to 18 months. And so you do have more difficult comparables in the second half of the year. Lastly, uh, we do expect commodity costs to be between low to mid-single digit. And again, do not only look at the spot price, it's the impact of the P&L. Do not underestimate the impact of foreign exchange, as well as duties and the like. And that's the reason why we stick with low to mid-single digit. So bottom line is, please don't get carried away with the gross margin, but the improvements are structural. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, next up we've got uh, James Edward Jones. Hello, James. Hello, Jim. Hi, Tim. Um, quick question on, on currencies. You referred, John Mark, to the likelihood of emerging market price rise in the second half, given currency weakness. To what extent does the underlying weakness in emerging market economies moderate your, your desires to raise prices in those markets? Well, we've um, always had this question now, uh, James, in all fairness, for the last five years that uh, some people are continuing to be concerned on the emerging markets. We've been very transparently saying that these economies are slowing down. You've seen that in China and in India and in Brazil. Uh, we, have a, uh, we deal with that by uh, launching new brands. In Brazil, we just launched uh, SIF and Domestos. We launched uh, Dove in uh, China less than 12 months ago. Uh, we're launching other variants in, in Indonesia, and the list goes on. 
So we compensate for that by stepping up our innovation pace, by working our costs, and, uh, and able to deal with that. There is no doubt, you just have to be realistic, there is no doubt that the weakening of these currencies over the last few months has been bigger and deeper than anybody has uh, anticipated. If you look at the, 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 the public opinion and the research that is publicly available that you get uh, probably more of than we do, nobody had estimated that. So we have to deal with it. The good thing is that having the strongest brands in these markets uh, that uh, allows you to deal with that uh, uh, better than our competitors and find the right balance. Um, so that is what we do and that is what we get paid for. And again, you see in the emerging markets a 10% growth. I also want to remind you, uh, James, that on, uh, on average for all of the emerging markets, there is not one market, I'm looking at your mark actually, but there's not one market where we have more than 8% of our turnover, no? That's, That's right. So we are a very well diversified company in that respect. And the whole discussion now about emerging markets, which is 60% of the business, soon 80% of the population, is becoming simplistic. The world is not anymore emerging market and D and E, uh, D and, D and E. In many of what, what we still have in these discussions as emerging markets, they have become very developed and very robust and we know how to deal with that. And that is what you see in these results again once more. Uh, I, I understand. Just, just to push you slightly, though, Paul, and d does yeah. the does this current, the, the underlying weakness in, in a number of emerging market economies, does that make you less inclined to, to, to force through price increases perhaps than you have in the past? No, we will look at that very granularly because there are many factors in there. There are competitive factors in there, there's relative brand strengths in there. Uh, we look at that very granularly. But the pricing that you see moving forward, there is no doubt in my mind that there will be pricing in the forecast. Uh, as we have the 5% the grossing speed in this environment where we are right now, uh, the 3% volume, 2% pricing is actually a, a very healthy mix. I don't think that will significantly change if you don't get too excited about three months here, three months there. And, and the main pricing will come from having to price for these uh, weakened currencies, and, and that we will be able to do. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, James. Now we've got Jeremy on the line. Jeremy Fialco. Hello, Jeremy. Uh, morning, Jeremy Kelko, Redman here. I've uh, really got one question for you, which is on um, this sort of SKU rationalization you're doing as part of uh, matching the mix. Uh, really, I wanted to get you know whether you could give us some sort of indication on you know, whether that did actually have any sort of meaningful drag on your underlying sales growth in the period, and whether it's a process which you think has actually got quite a lot further to go, and it's something we need to kind of bear in mind when thinking about your sales growth over kind of coming quarters. Thanks. Yeah. What, uh, and that's a good question, Jeremy. What I believe is that the, a company is fit to win when they have the end mentality, not the or mentality. Often people say, well, if you uh, bring down your inventories, your customer service goes down. Or if you ask your customers to pay quicker, uh, they will order less from you. We've proven that to be wrong. Some people will say, if you want better products, it has to cost more. We've proven that to be wrong. And uh, some people will say you need more SKUs to grow. I actually am in the camp that if you have less SKUs, you can grow better. If you have more SKUs, there are always some SKUs on life support. And you know the National Health Service is becoming pretty expensive. So rationalizing these uh, SKUs is uh, actually helping us bring in more focus. Sure, there might in some cases be a short-term effect uh, in a quarter. But uh, longer term, it gives you better brands, better equities. Uh, where we see the short-term effect of this SKU rationalization, because we're about 20% down in SKUs, but I think we have a lot more to go. But for example, in the U.S., in, um, in ice cream, there is some uh, take-home, uh, big top type uh, ice cream variants that were totally unprofitable for us in our definition, uh, and uh, so we go out of that. There we make first the decision to go out, and it might take a little bit of time to migrate some of the consumers, but it's the right thing to do. And we have a few of those examples. But broadly, it should result in a, a stronger focus, stronger brands, and ultimately uh, stronger growth in a tougher environment. Could you just clarify, you talked about being 20% down in SKUs. Can you tell us across what businesses and over what oh, time this is, um, is? This happens across every business. You know, a, a company like ours has uh, 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 over 100,000 SKUs uh, in, in the business because uh, of the different... Uh, uh, countries, sizes, promotional activities, the innovation pace. But for example, in Europe, we were relatively uh, less developed, in my opinion, on leveraging the European menu of SKUs. So if every country cuts by 20%, uh, 
but you have better uh, transferability of SKUs across Europe, you can actually give the countries more choice, although your total portfolio of SKUs is less. So you have to think about that smartly. We see the SKU reductions, obviously Savory has a lot of it, because and we've done a lot of it, because that's a very more complex uh, category, but also in the other areas we've done that. And part of that is coming from reducing our promotional activities as we strengthen our innovations and strengthen our brand equities. So it's across the board, and we want to give everybody credit for that, but for the Unilever people that are listening in, I also would say we still have some way to go there, so I hope that is registered as well. So thanks, uh, Jeremy. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Ian, Ian Simpson. Hello, Ian. Hi there. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, just a couple of quick questions from me, if I may. Um, you talked about uh, some inventory level change uh, as a result of sort of SAP changes in Latin America. Could you just quantify the impact of that on organic growth, either in your sort of Latin American business uh, or at the group level? That would be extremely helpful. And then secondly, on laundry, when you say that your sort of lean program uh, is 25% of the way there, um, Presumably, is, is that sort of 25% in terms of time to implement, or is it 25% in terms of um, sort of savings to be achieved? That would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ian. I'll hand it over to Sean Mark for that time. Yeah, so if you were to just adjust uh, to your question, uh, Brazil would remain a double-digit growth business in the second quarter. Latin America would also remain a, a double-digit growth uh, for the quarter. Yeah. Then on, on uh, laundry, I would, uh, I would agree with you there. The, uh, the rollout, we have done that by priority countries. And even in the priority countries where we roll out, we haven't fully implemented these programs because sometimes some structural changes in our sourcing or in our go-to-market need to happen. So when we talk about 25%, it is 25% of implementation potential across the world. Uh, a lot of the savings uh, are still, therefore, to be had as well, uh, but it's not about the same 25%. Obviously, where we have implemented first, is also where we got the biggest bang for the buck because that is obviously uh, responsible. So I think in the savings time, we might be 40% um, on the way and we still have 60% to go. Uh, I would be the first one to say being responsible for home care, that that unit does an outstanding job defending itself against very aggressive promotion-oriented buy-in of, of some of our competitors trying to get into some of the, the countries. Uh, the latest one is... Uh, South Africa, or we see the same continuous uh, irresponsible behavior in the South Con. So we have to deal with that phenomena. We will always stay competitive. But at the same time now, I think we will have a focus on the mix and we will have a focus on low-cost business models that should guarantee continued margin expansion. And that is the most responsible way to, to run that business. And uh, we're pleased about that one. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. Ian, thank you. Uh, Javier Escalante, I think Javier on the line, Javier. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm trying to get this gross margin question dead for once and for all, and I guess one good way to do it to the extent possible would be if Jean Marc please would kind of like break out the 120 basis uh, margin improvement between raw material inflation or the lack of thereof mix and the more structural part, which is the supply chain initiatives. Would that be possible? And tell us how that we are supposed to be looking at in the second half. Yeah. No, Javier, uh, in due respect, uh, I, I appreciate your question, but we are not going that granularly, nor do we want gross margin discussions to be dead. We want gross margin discussions to be alive as well inside the company and outside all the time as we move it into the right direction. And moving that into the right direction in a company of this size and complexity means delivering the numbers but juggling many variables. And to go into that level of granularity is a little bit of chicken and egg discussion we don't want to do. There's a clear mix coming through. There's a clear uh, ongoing savings program going through. There's a clear innovation part coming through with margin accretive innovations. There is a clear part of letting go of unprofitable activities 
All these things add up. And then obviously you have to deal with the volatility of commodity prices that might or might not get reflected in your ability to price or not price. So it's all we understand the dynamics of this, but we don't spend any time internally anymore to uh, break that down and, uh, and do the work for someone else. So don't let the gross margin discussions go dead. Keep it alive as well. Hold us accountable of continuing to improve it like we've now done for the second semester and like we're planning to do moving forward. Well, keep it alive. Thank you. Uh, but the second question that I have has to do with the desire to improve the food business. Uh, and some of the weakness has to do with margarine, and the issues there seems to be a structural. And uh, yes, I understand that you are you know, working on the R&D part, but do you think that you may need to correct pricing vis-a-vis -vis butter uh, in order to stabilize volumes in, in margarine, both in the U.S. and Europe. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks, Javier. Outright answer is yes, not, not beating around the bush. In the U.S., we're actually growing share because we've actually done that. In the results you see now, including the, the gross margin improvement as a company, we have put prices back in the U.S. at competitive levels. We've been too lax, too late. And we know that in that business that we are in, if you're off pricing strategy, you're not even getting the right to play in the game. So we need to be far more disciplined there. And frankly, uh, first of all, let me remind you that spreads is about 7% of our total business, but we are as passionate about that as the other 93%. The US is growing again now and is growing share. We have some good innovations coming up and we're taking that same approach now in Europe and we're willing to do that to get that business growing again, all with a very responsible mindset of ensuring that the total Unilever uh, company provides uh, the top and bottom line progress. And you will see that coming through. On top of that, we obviously have stepped up our innovations. That takes a little bit of time and as that gets through the whole value chain. But just let me uh, remind you that, that as of now, we have just introduced in the markets in Fruit d'Or, which is a very important brand in France. As you know, the, the Naturellement Bon, which is naturally bien, uh, good, a product which is off to a great start. The Bertoli has introduced new melanges in the Benelux as we talk, and the goodness of sunflower campaign, which is obviously a much healthier product than, than butter, is now hitting the uh, UK. We've also corrected the taste of flora, where we frankly did not have the consumer preferred uh, taste. So we have uh, taken uh, quite some drastic steps quite fast in this business over the last six months that are now hitting the marketplace. But to come back to your question, pricing and staying on strategy on pricing is a must. And we have been poorly managing the enormous cycle of up and down on commodity in this category. And I can only say shame on us, but we are fixing that now, like we have fixed all the other things in the business that we're talking about. And can I squeeze one more thing? It's basically, if you can help us, I think that you mentioned that currency neutral EPS was up 7%, but at least from what I understand based on consensus and based on my own model, uh, below the line items uh, were a drag uh, in this first half relative to consensus estimates and my own estimates. Do you mind telling us what would it be your assessments of core operating profit growth uh, in, on a currency neutral basis, please? Yeah. I'll yeah, let, let me just try and give some uh, help uh, below the line to use it. I'm not going to uh, comment on any of your expectations. First reiteration, just on our tax rate, um, it was at around 27% for the year, should be 26%. The reason why it's somewhat higher is because of the tax on disposals. So 26% is the right number for the year. If you're looking at our interest expense, somewhat higher. Return on cash is a little bit lower. Cost of debt, roughly the same. Couple of uh, one-off items uh, in the second quarter. As you're looking at the second half of the year, remember that net debt is that much higher as we begin the second half than where we were on the 1st of January. So you need to take that into account, and I think we've had enough discussion on gross margin, AMP, and overheads for you to make the other calculations. The actual impact of foreign exchange, like I told you, in terms of top line is around 4.5%. In terms of core EPS, it's probably closer to 5%, 5% plus for the year. Thank you. Thanks, Javier.
Okay, Javier, sneaking an extra one in there. We, we need to be crisp now because we're beginning to run out of time, but we've got Warren Ackerman on the line. Hello, Warren. Good morning, guys. It's uh, Warren Ackerman here at StockGen. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one is, I mean, gross margins up 120 basis points, but operating margin up 40 basis points in the first half. I mean, obviously, the operational leverage would have been a lot better if overheads were not up 40 bips. And the question is, how much of the 40 bips related to the first half last year regarding the Indian property profits? I think it was 20 bips on the operating margin in H1 last year. And then, Jean-Marc, should we expect the overheads to be back into positive territory in H2, especially given your comments regarding the enhanced plans on overhead that you talked about today? And where do you see that sort of extra potential coming from? And then the second one is, I'm surprised we haven't had the emerging market question yet, so I guess I'm going to ask it. I mean, you've now delivered the ninth consecutive quarter of double-digit growth at a time when the concern would be that you know, growth would slow, which is obviously a very, very strong performance. Does that mean, Paul, that market share gains are accelerating in emerging markets? And if so, where is that most evident? Despite your comment, I think you used the word reinvigorated uh, competition there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, Warren. Um, I, I just want to be very quick. On the, on the indirects, these are indeed uh, once-off items. Underlying indirects over the first half is flat. We expect the whole year to be down. So there's no question about that. Um, and what you see there is, is the effects of summer cruel and in India. So there's nothing there to be worried about, and we shouldn't spend more time on that. On the emerging markets, uh, we are growing shares. That's, that's absolutely uh, true. But we've always said that the main driver for growth, uh, Warren, in the emerging markets is market development in our categories, which is well ahead of the economic development. And at the same time, obviously, we uh, continue to have an aggressive uh, launch plan. We shared with you last time that we've launched in about 200 country brand combinations just in the last three years alone. That continues. This year there's another 40 or 50 being added to that and that is also uh, holding up. If your question is uh, can you maintain the 10% uh, growth rate in emerging markets, my answer is no. And I've said that every call we've had. Now that, does that mean we don't do it next time? We'll see because there's a lot of factors that play there. But it is irrealistic to expect continuous 10% growth uh, in, a, in a, the base getting higher and uh, the economy is getting tougher. But we are uh, setting the bar higher in the company to deal with that and hope to continue to move up our innovations, move up our uh, competitive bite to compensate for that. So far we've been able to do that and I'm very pleased about that. I think that uh, the balance between Europe, US, if you put it that way, and the emerging markets will slightly rebalance again to keep the overall growth of the company, uh, but probably the emerging markets coming off a little bit of the 10% would be realistic to, to uh, plan on. There's no problem for us there. It's uh, just the, the dynamics of what we're facing. But we're, we're pleased with, with the 10% growth. Or, uh, obviously, in home care, that's more than 10% growth, and personal care is more than 10% growth to get the overall 10% growth. And these are obviously a fabulous growth rates because they happen in markets where the competitive intensity is as enormous as it is uh, in this part of the world. And sorry, just to clarify the question on the overheads, uh, um, are you saying, sorry, it was up 40 bits in H1, are you saying, Paul, that it will be down for the year? Is that what you, is that what you said? Um, f because of the exceptional item for India, we have to, if you take the exceptional item yeah. out, uh, it will be down for the year. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Warren. James, James Target on the line. James? Oh, good morning. Hi, it's uh, James Target here from Berenberg. Um, just, just two for me. Um, firstly, just like it's following on from, um, from the emerging market question, um, just trying to reconcile the, you know, the solid, solid performance in the second quarter with perhaps a more, a more cautious outlook statement. I just wanted, looking at the Asian and AMIT region, if there are any particular you know, countries or categories uh, that you were concerned about uh, more than any other. Uh, and then secondly, just on the, um, the, the innovation pipeline, you said it was obviously very strong uh, for the second half of the year. Is there anything we should think about in terms of sort of law, launch costs or um, extra AMP spend, which might um, affect the, uh, the amount of the gross margin falls through the bottom line? Thank you. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, again, the right things. You know, in, in D&E, you say uh, a more cautious outlook. I would say uh, this company has always had the same words, the same outlook. We've always said... Uh, it's getting tougher in the emerging markets. 
you all interpret that Unilever is going to do worse. That's for you to do, that's not for us to do. But we will continue to uh, manage the business on a tougher emerging market. We've proven that to be a very valid strategy. And that is one of the reasons, I think, why we've been able to keep this growth rate, because we've adjusted our plans accordingly. Um, so we will continue to be uh, of the same mindset that, that uh, the global economy uh, is, is more likely to be a little bit tougher. I think we've lost 1% growth, according to the OECD and the global economy, just over the last 12 months. So that's the reality of it. That's nothing to do with Unilever. And then we have to figure out what to do. Let me just remind you that we have been in the emerging markets for quite a long time, uh, over 100 years in many of these places. If I take the last 25 years, our average growth rate in the emerging markets has been 9%. And there have been ups and downs a little bit in that one, but it has been 9%. And I think moving forward, that potential is there. If you don't get too excited of three or six months and make your life depend on that, you have a company that is very well positioned to continue to capitalize on that. And frankly, if it's 9% or 8%, with the quality that we are now putting in there, including the profitability, as you've noticed, I think you should be very pleased from a shareholder perspective. What we are focused on is obviously have that growth be diversified. As I said, not one country more than 8%. We are now truly, uh, unlike our competitive base, in all countries with strong businesses. We have now established our Chinese business, well over 2 billion euros. Our Russian business has now critical mass, doubled every five years for the last 10 years. So we have now a very, very good business with a few white spaces that obviously we are addressing. Our innovations are getting better, our new brand launches are more robust, and our uh, go-to-market capabilities are better. You take India, for example. We've added a million stores. I mean, it's hard to believe. This is a country we've been in since 1888, where we established our operations in 1903. And then the Indian organization, under Nitin's leadership, comes back and says, hey, what? We can set the bar higher. We can find another million stores. We've added 20,000 Shakti ladies. So it is uh, the perfect store program, uh, now in 6 million stores, well ahead of target. So a lot of people in this system are working very hard uh, that when, when the going gets tougher in these markets, that's really where you see the robustness of this organization and the tough get going. And I'm very pleased to see how we respond to that. On the innovations and AMP in the second half, once more, I've always said, and you now have some credibility, that AMP and Unilever, at least under my watch, is not a tap on, a turn on and turn off the tap. Every year when we can, we will manage also the, gross, the core operating margin expansion by being sure that the fr first priority is to protect our brands. That's what you pay for. When you buy into a, a company like this, you buy into goodwill and brand equity that we create on our own books by making our brand stronger. And that can only come by being sure that the quality AMP is there. I'm very pleased that the first half, again, has over 200 million euros in AMP. And I will be very pleased, no doubt, that the second half will also have an increase in AMP. And if that would not happen, we now have the system in Unilever of full transparency, and by the way, also the system of discipline to deal with that. Uh, we cannot just have company assets that have to live in the long term be dependent on one person or another by turning on and turning off the tap. That's like playing with fire. That's the essence of this company. So I'm passionate about that. On top of that, under Key Suite's leadership and the global media uh, setup that we now have, uh, uh, we really are bringing in the capabilities. This creating brands for life uh, has really translated into Unilever becoming again the marketing company by excellence. I was very pleased to see we are now the second most looked up company in LinkedIn, but I'm very pleased to see that we are the preferred company globally for marketing people. That gives me reassurance because I think we had forgotten that we, as Unilever, first and foremost should be a marketing company about brands and not about restructuring. So all that is coming back, but all that needs to be supported with AMP, all that we will continue to do. And uh, don't worry about that. And write this down so that six months from now, your first question confirms that, then we would be very pleased because we really... Um, continue to say what we do and do what we say. Yeah? We said we would get the growth back, we get the growth back. We said we need to first get that in the emerging markets uh, healthy, we do that with PC. We say we need to get the HC business profitable, you see the first signs on that, the home care business. Then we say we need to fix tea, I'm dissatisfied about that, I think you're starting to see the signs on beverages. Now we say the food business needs to grow, this is actually the second quarter, if someone peels the numbers you will see the food business is going up first the first quarter. And now we see we have an issue with spreads. I'll be the first one that takes that responsibility. 
I have not delivered on spreads. I'm ultimately the, the responsible person. But I feel now that we are on the right track to do this. We've changed the team. We have a good strategy. So I hope I can report better numbers on spreads, otherwise I lose my own credibility. But it will be in a tougher market, so the overall numbers, I think, will more or less stay the same. And that, that is a good performance for now if you buy into the long term. So that's where we are, uh, tough as it may be. Uh, the good thing is we all have holidays. I hope you are enjoying them as well. If there is one group that needs to take a few weeks off, it's you guys because you've been extremely supportive uh, of our company and we appreciate obviously the continued interest. As I said, this transformation is fully on track. We're growing the top line competitively. Our gross margins are now also improving consistently and we are able to invest in the business for continued growth. But we are not stupid. The competitive environment is getting tougher. The economic environment is getting tougher. New competitors are entering. We need to set the bar higher. The past performance, our strategy up to date, only got us this far. And we now have to raise the bar and again once more talk to you about what the next steps are in this transformation of Unilever. And that is the sharpened and renewed strategy that we will obviously talk to you in December. And that is what we are working now and discussing with the board. I certainly look forward to seeing you there. But more importantly, I would be all very pleased if you have a wonderful time with your family, recharge the batteries, and see you all back in a few months' time. Thank you very much.